Market to Market is everywhere you are. Subscribe to Market to Market on YouTube, find us on the PBS video app to stream on demand, and add our three podcasts on your favorite podcasting app. Coming up on Market to Market, getting some outside the beltway perspective for the next farm bill, a jump start for climate smart practices in agriculture. No carbon pipeline! A battle over capturing greenhouse gas in the Midwest. And market analysis with Mark Gold, next. What's the most complex industry on Earth? It's not genetics, or meteorology, or logistics. It's a business that involves them all. It's farming. Thank you, farmers, from Pioneer. Sukup Manufacturing Company, providing equipment and buildings to store and condition grain to help farmers adjust to market swings. We build drying, moving, and storage equipment designed to preserve the quality of their crops. Sukup Manufacturing, store now, profit later. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today. This is the Friday, July 29 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Brooke Kohlsdorf. Paul Yeager is on assignment. Recession is defined as a period of temporary economic decline during which trade and industrial activity are reduced, generally identified by a fall in GDP in two successive quarters. However, there are a growing number of economists from Wall Street to Pennsylvania Avenue saying the issue is a bit more complex and the situation may not be as dire. While GDP has had a downturn in two consecutive quarters, the Personal Consumption Expenditure Index rose 7.1 percent, the same rate as the first quarter. Excluding food and energy prices, the PCE index increased 4.4 percent. Personal income moved higher for both non-farm proprietors and farm business owners. The Fed, working to cool a red-hot inflation rate of 9.1 percent and the threat of a recession, added 75 basis points to the prime lending rate. The uncertainty about economic conditions in the future is weighing on rural Americans. Farmers and ranchers are looking down the road for some kind of relief. One source might be the next farm bill as producers tell Congress what they'd like to see in the 2023 edition of the bill, Peter Tubbs found out that, like politics, all farming is local. Monday, the House Ag Committee held its fourth listening session of the year in Rice County, Minnesota. The previous sessions had occurred in the western United States, and speakers there focused on water issues. The Midwestern crowd shared several comments about tying subsidized crop insurance to conservation practices. You know, it's really a food security, rural development bill. There's a lot of, you know, this is the only bill that really funds a lot of rural America. You know, it's not only providing farmers protection to keep them on the farm, but, you know, the example is given a crop insurance. You know, it, the intent is not to profit off it. The intent is if you go through a crop disaster to keep you on the farm. First, crop insurance must be actuarially sound. All farmers who want to participate should be allowed to. This means no size limits or ties to other conserv programs like conservation that do not affect a farmer's risk profile. Keeping climate and conservation initiatives inside the conservation title makes the most sense rather than tying them to crop insurance. We really need to stay focused on keeping farmers in business. When we ask farmers, ranchers, and forest landowners to implement conservation practices, they should be fully supported and appropriately compensated. These practices benefit all of society. Speakers were also concerned about the difficulty beginning farmers have in gaining access to the land. But young farmers can't afford $350 rent, $10,000 plus uh, land costs with the high input costs. Uh, and, uh, you know, they just can't possibly compete with the mega farms that we're seeing. In the next Farm Bill, we will need to acknowledge that the playbook is changing and we need policies that recognize diverse models of how food is produced. And we need policies that support farm viability for young farmers and for farmers of color. I think we've got to find a way uh, to 
enable the beginning farmer to, uh, you know, better be able to finance the land, right? I mean, it is, um, it's extraordinary just, you know, how much land costs in my congressional district. Well, I think what we heard today is don't mess with crop insurance, it's working. And so there's real concern among our family farmers really to do anything to it. I, don't, I didn't see the comments as a resistance to conservation, but just not to link conservation pra practices with crop insurance. For Market to Market, I'm Peter Tubbs. Looking to give Americans some relief from high inflation rates, the Senate agreed to take up what is being called the Inflation Reduction Act of 2022. Over half of the $739 billion package is devoted to climate change. This includes an injection of $20 billion into the rural economy for so-called climate smart initiatives. The multi-billion dollar incentive package is expected to help pay for wind, solar and carbon capture projects. While the concept of implementing climate change mitigation measures may look good on paper, the reality of putting them into practice includes assessing the impact on those around you. Josh Bittner has more in our cover story. After rallying in vain against the Dakota Access Pipeline, activists in Iowa brought reinforcements to push back on a new proposal to transport a different hazardous material beneath the state's fertile landscapes. Dakota Access, we did not win with the Iowa Utilities Board because we didn't have the support of the landowners. Um, but because of Dakota Access, we saw the damage it does to the land. People are now aware that this is not a good thing. Complaints of crop loss and soil issues have followed since 2017, when Dakota Access began pumping over half a million barrels of Bakken crude per day across four Midwestern states. The Midwest Carbon Express, the first of three similar proposals to seek final approval from Iowa regulators, would annually transport 20 million tons of liquefied CO2, captured as a byproduct of corn-based ethanol production, from plants in Iowa, Nebraska, Minnesota, and the Dakotas to sequester in an underground reservoir in North Dakota. The IUP welcomes public comments. The Iowa Utilities Board has final say on pipeline construction permits, and stakeholders who've dug in their heels fear the board will grant eminent domain again. CO2 is an asphyxiant. CO2 is heavier than air, and it can flow to low-lying areas. Based on a demonstration in Europe with an eight inch line, if there is a leak or rupture, every living thing within 1300 feet will be dead in less than four minutes. According to IUB officials, as of mid-July, boards of supervisors in 25 of 30 counties affected have formally objected to the route over use of eminent domain. Proponents prefer the voluntary easements they've secured from over 650 landowners so far about 40 percent of the 680 miles needed in Iowa. If you take a step back and say, why are we doing this project? It's to make ethanol more profitable. We think this will be as transformational as the original renewable fuel standard was for Iowa landowners and the landowners across the five states that we're operating in. That ethanol plant's going to make more money. That farmer's going to make more money long term. It's going to support land values and it's going to support those local communities. Justin Kirkhoff is president of Summit Ag Investors, parent company of Summit Carbon Solutions, which has proposed the $4.5 billion pipeline. Kirkhoff says an average ethanol plant stands to make an additional $15 million per year when partnered with Summit. Summit claims the project will support 360,000 jobs and, in Iowa, generate $73 million in state and local taxes during construction and continue filling coffers during operation. I think the scar tissue of Dakota Access in many ways has actually brought out a lot of good new regulation. A farmer himself, Kirkhoff says the Iowa Legislature and the Iowa Utilities Board have tightened up pipeline requirements and Summit has vowed to cover lost yields. The ethanol industry has been actively working to lower emissions for years. Summit claims new federal climate priorities make their project viable. If ethanol has the ability to get their carbon footprint lower than an electric vehicle, we need to take advantage of those incentives and build the infrastructure out and make them more competitive long term. 
According to global financial conglomerate KPMG, U.S. Code Section 45Q tax credits reward carbon sequestration, but also pertain to use in enhanced oil recovery or fracking. Summit denies their product will be used for fracking and say their petition for a hazardous liquid pipeline permit clearly spells out their intentions. The pipeline is supposed to be four foot deep and most of my tile are buried three to five feet deep. I can't imagine that my tile system will ever work as good as it does today. Farmer turned activist Dan Tronchetti doesn't buy it, pointing to a spring 2021 Bismarck Tribune article with Summit CEO Bruce Rastetter, a high profile Iowa GOP donor, who said the company was exploring other gas injection options. We have one additional rulemaking open. Opponents uh, cry foul on myriad political connections associated with the pipeline and blame such clout for uh, sluggish review in the state legislature. Things like these pipeline issues are what remind us that our value systems are actually the same. It's the political system that's telling us that we're so different. Iowa Sierra Club Conservation Coordinator Jess Mazur says unlikely allies in the fight have been seeking an audience with the governor for over six months. Governor Kim Reynolds, in her response to Joe Biden's State of the Union address, she said you shouldn't have to wake up every morning and worry about the next thing the government is going to do to you, your business, or your children. I've had a lot of sleepless nights worrying about what the Iowa Utilities Board is going to do to me. Tronchetti says any pipeline could be sold and assurances wiped out, and his insurance underwriters won't guarantee him indemnity. You know, when the ethanol industry first started, uh, I was pretty skeptical. Retired Cherokee County farmer Tom Doerr says the benefits outweigh the costs, and for better or worse, government and business are going all in on capturing carbon. A former president of the U.S. Grains Council and USDA Undersecretary for Rural Development during the Bush administration, Doerr helped provide funds to build out ethanol plants spurred by the RFS. His family have signed easements with Summit. Just like ethanol and wind turbines, he says pipelines are unique rural development opportunities that impact local schools, health care, real estate, and workforces. All of these things collectively create significant uh, economic growth uh, that I think is, is it's, it's not responsible to dismiss it. As Summit continues to seek cooperation, the Dakota access controversy has provided a roadmap for all sides. Critics say taxpayers subsidize the mandated ethanol industry and shouldn't have to pay more to clean up associated pollution. So we're going to fight the approval of it, and then if it is approved, we're going to take it to court. And like we've seen in many other pipeline fights, then we'll be fighting the construction. For Market to Market, I'm Josh Bittner. Next, the Market to Market report. The weather, economic news, and the Russians shooting missiles at Ukrainian ports pushed the market higher. For the week, the nearby wheat contract jumped 49 cents, while the September corn contract skyrocketed 52 cents. Predictions of hot and dry weather, along with the prospect of biofuel incentives in the Inflation Reduction Act, bumped the nearby soybean contract 128 higher. September meal rose 43.10 per ton. December cotton added 585 per hundredweight. And over in the dairy parlor, September class three milk futures added 26 cents. The livestock market was mixed. October cattle shed 77 cents. September feeders cut 293, and the October lean hog contract put on 90 cents. In the er, currency markets, the U.S. dollar index fell 80 ticks. September crude oil gained 412. Comex gold improved 4170 per ounce, and the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index improved nearly 28 points to finish at 693.15. And joining us now to provide some insight on all of this is Mark Gold. Welcome back. Nice to be here. Nice to see you. Yeah, nice to meet you, Mark. Um, we'll start with some big economic news that's been um, putting some pressure on the markets. We had earlier in the show that the GDP fell for a second quarter yeah. in a row. And a lot of economists believe that this is sort of the mark of the start of a recession. Yeah. How is this weighing on the grain markets? 
Well, we've had a pretty good rally despite all this bad news. We had uh, interest rates go up, we had the GDP, and the grain market still had a pretty good rally. So it hasn't had much of an effect. Is it a recession, people are asking? Yes, it's a recession. And they may come back and change these numbers. They're always famous for the next quarter revising the numbers. So maybe the 0.9 isn't a 0.9, who knows? But this is what we're living with right now. It is what it is. But I haven't seen it so far take a big toll on the grain markets. Yeah, the wheat really had a rally uh, this past week. What's been the main driver with this? Is it the news that Ukraine could start exporting grain again? Well, I think it's been a couple of things. You know, if I was sitting in this chair a week ago when the grains were on their lows and everything looked pretty miserable, if I would have told you soybeans, November beans had rally $2 a bushel, corn and, and wheat 70 75 cents a bushel, people would have said I was crazy, and rightfully so. But what happened, that's what happened. Now, the wheat rallied because no sooner than the Russians signed the agreement on Thursday at some point, they were firing missiles into Odessa. So is the agreement for real? Nobody knows. Now, we do know that there's at least three ships ready to move out of port over the weekend, and there's a fairly long line waiting to come in, too. Now, do the Russians fire on those ships? If they do, wheat will take off again in a big way next week. Uh, you know, Putin knows how to play these markets as well as anybody, and I think that's part of what's going on out here. It looks like maybe, as we saw a big break on Friday from Friday's opening to Friday's close in the wheat, that maybe things are going to open up a little bit. We know somebody came out and with a comment today that Crimea has exported 50 times the amount of wheat that they would normally export in this time, which tells me that the Russians are selling stolen Ukrainian wheat and they're selling it out of Crimea. Mm. So there is wheat coming to the market and I think that's gonna continue to be part of the story. But as we know, we harvest wheat somewhere every month around the world. And as those supplies come in, things I think will make it a little bit tougher for the wheat market to rally. Mm. But if there's a missile on a ship anytime soon, Weed prices will react to that in a positive way. Everyone keeps calling it a fluid situation, and it, <laughs> it is. Um, so there are also reports that the EU and Russia, their yields are much less than expected. Will that also be weighing on the market? Well, I think the EU has certainly had some problems. You know, France has been burning up. Uh, Germany, Spain have all had some problems. The Russian crop isn't that bad. They're looking at record exports. So I don't see that Russia is that big of a problem. But the question is, who's going to buy it? How are they going to pay for it? Are they going to pay for it in rubles? That's been probably one of the biggest surprises in this whole Russian deal, is after the war hit, you know, two, three days later, the ruble is nearly worthless. Now it's significantly higher than before the war. And that's because Russia is demanding payment in rubles and people are chasing around for rubles. But the fact of the matter is, uh, whether it's Russia, the EU, we'll still be harvesting wheat around the world. You know, sh sooner than we would think, the South American crops will be a factor, and we're going to be a factor here. I, I look at the crop ratings on winter wheat being around 30% good to excellent all year, yet we're still going to have a pretty large crop considering the crop ratings. Mm. Now, it's not going to be a, a great crop, but... You know, people are talking about the yields on corn and beans right now. Yeah, they're hurting, no question. And But, you know, the ratings are still 60. Maybe they'll drop below 50 here this week. I don't know. But the fact of the matter is we can still have pretty good crops, even with low crop progress ratings on a weekly basis. Well, that kind of brings us into weather. The long-term weather forecasts are showing really dry um, and very little rain. And yeah. the models have all kind of had agreement on this. Yeah. Is that the thing pushing corn right now? Well, I think that's been the biggest thing for soybeans and corn since last Friday when we had those lousy closes. The forecast changed hot and dry into the first week to eight, 10 days of August. Uh, not going to have as much of an impact on corn, but right here in Iowa, next Wednesday, you're looking at 104 degrees. That's fairly unprecedented. It's going to go 97, 97, 100, 104, and then starting to come back down. The west coast of the country, we're talking about 109 degrees in in Washington State, Idaho, Washington State, Oregon, all having extremely high temperatures. Not that that's going to have a huge impact, maybe a little bit more on the uh, spring wheat than anything else, but the heat 
when you look at these forecasts, that's what made this market move. That's why November beans moved almost $2 a bushel in five trading days. Uh, but we have to keep in mind that the market knows this. It's in the market. I think it's one of the reasons we backed off today later in the sessions. And we've had a nice run here. And weather forecasts can change, as we all know. <laughs> yes. And, you know, what looks hot and dry today. The forecast I saw just this afternoon looked like there were good rains pushing through Kansas, mm. Nebraska, mm -hmm. Tennessee, Kansas, Tennessee, Arkansas, um, Kentucky, all areas that needed rains. Now they've had some flooding, but the fact of the matter is some of the really dry areas mm -hmm. are getting some good rain. So there's a little bit of a balance here, and we'll see if the forecasts hold up. Well, and that kind of leads us to our, our Twitter question. So with the two-week forecast ahead very hot and dry, even though there is some rain, as you mentioned, all other fundamentals known, where does the price go from here in the next few weeks? What about winter and spring prices? Well, if I knew that, I'd be long retired by now. <laughs> but I can say that we, we put a lot of this into the market early. We react early. The media is on top of it, so all the news is there. And you see these forecasts in the heat dome. And, you know, certainly if the weather holds hot and dry next week, we can move higher. Mm -hmm. uh, if the funds want to add to their long positions in corn and beans, they can certainly do that. Um, where do we go fall, winter? I think whatever crescendo we hit, we'll hit it really in the next week or 10 days is my guess. Unless we get to the third and fourth week in August and those predictions are hot and dry and the models are all... In, in agreement with that, we make the beans in August. We don't make the beans in July. We're still mm -hmm. in July. Yes, it's going to hurt. We're po pretty much getting through pollination now in a lot of the areas. So heat isn't going to have as big an effect on the corn, but on the beans, that can be a different matter. So if we do get hot and dry those last two weeks of August, we can certainly move them higher. Yeah, is the heat um, dropping any notion of record crops with beans right now? Well, I don't... I still think you can have a pretty good bean crop. You know, are we going to be 150 something on the 170, excuse me, 177 on the corn yields? Probably not. Is it, I saw one estimate yesterday, 175, but we've had some rains. Now it's going to get hot and dry again. Is that going to hurt it again? I was talking to somebody at a conference today and he was betting on 170. I don't think we're going to go that low. I really don't, unless mm. it really gets furnace hot mm -hmm. and, and virtually no rains. But uh, yeah. the, the, it's still a weather market. We're still in July and August, and we're still subject to the heat. Yeah. All right, well, we'll move on to cattle. So temps, yes, in the triple digits um, expected this week. Is the cattle market feeling the effects of the heat? I, I think there's no question about it. We've moved a lot of cattle in, into the uh, system to get them off. The feed, there's no feed in a lot of areas, so they've got to bring these cattle in. We know that there's some losses out there. Uh, black cattle can't handle this heat, yeah. so they're going to slaughter. As we push forward, where are we going to get the numbers from forward? We saw that the cattle numbers themselves are a little bit lower than a year ago. We did see placements a little bit higher than were expected, and that put the feeder cattle mar market under some pressure. But as much as anything else, the feeder cattle market has been following the corn market. The corn breaks, the feeder cattle rally. The corn breaks, uh, we get the rallies. If it moves high, corn moves higher, we see lower feeder cattle prices. But overall, the charts don't look all that bad to me in either cattle or feeder cattle. Uh, the box beef demand has been strong. Mm. Cash prices up to 145 in Iowa this week. So those are good prices. Yeah, it's... It's 137 in Texas, it's 138 in Kansas. There's a big disparagement between northern and southern cattle, and I think that's because those southern cattle are coming into market. Mm -hmm. But once that gets cleaned up, I think we can see futures and cash prices move higher around the country. Okay, well, you kind of answered my question about what's kind of pushing the feeder market around uh, higher corn prices. With recession concerns, how much is this going to impact consumer demand? You have a minute. Well... I like to think that the demand is going to stay pretty strong for beef. The stock market, you know, we talk about recession, but the stock market has been on a pretty good rally the last three days after the interest rates were announced, after the GDP were moving significantly higher. That's telling us that the market is less concerned about a, a 
a hard, deep recession and maybe a smaller, long-lasting recession. And that, I think, is a little bit friendly for the markets because every, everybody's been so bearish. Uh, maybe that's what we're seeing out here. So even with recession, I'm hopeful that the cattle market can stay and stay good and see some good demand out here. Stock market's strong. People have money to buy more beef. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, Mark. Thanks. It's a pleasure yeah. to be here. Nice, uh, nice talking the markets with you today. All right, well, we will continue the conversation with Mark and answer more of the questions you've submitted in our Market Plus segment. You can also find it on our website of markettomarket.org in podcast form and on YouTube. All of these resources are free. Well, it is hot out there. We talked about that a lot today, and for it's for much of the country. You can help us see how your summer is going with a few shots from around the farm. Post a few pics and then tag them market to market show and then give us a follow. Next week, we look at how container ships get a new port of call in the Great Lakes. I'm Brooke Kohlsdorf. Thanks for watching and have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa PBS, which is solely responsible for its content. What's the most complex industry on Earth? It's not genetics, or meteorology, or logistics. It's a business that involves them all. It's farming. Thank you, farmers, from Pioneer. Sukup Manufacturing Company, providing equipment and buildings to store and condition grain to help farmers adjust to market swings. We build drying, moving, and storage equipment designed to preserve the quality of their crops. Sukup Manufacturing. Store now, profit later. Tomorrow. For over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today.